Hi, everybody. How you doing? That didn't sound so good. I'm sorry you're not doing better. I hope you improve. <laughs> Here we are in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, beginning of verse 1, and reading down to the end of verse number 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm speaking through 2 Timothy, as you know. Um, the message this morning will ultimately uh, bore you and um, shock you. <laughs> I hope the shock parts keep you awake. I hope it does. Here we are in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, that is, uh, stories that they make up themselves. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is what I really think. I think that in, in the 21st century, the church has lost its excitement. People aren't excited about the church anymore. They're not excited about what the church does anymore. And I said about going to church, and I'm not just talking about uh, people who don't know Jesus or haven't come to church yet. I'm talking about believers. We're not even excited as we should be about church. I think we've forgotten really who we are, what we're about. That's why we've lost our excitement. You know, I'm coming up in just a few weeks on 50 years of marriage, and I promise you, after the 50 years passes by, I won't talk about it all the time like I've been doing so recently, but um, 50 years of marriage. And I remember when I was dating Debbie, I would come to her house nearby Ward's Corner, and I'd walk up the sidewalk, up the steps. She had that black doorbell there, and when I think I came up to the doorbell to push it, I was tingling all over. And I, I couldn't believe that she was dating me. And I couldn't believe that she was going to marry me. And, by the way, I think most men, if you're honest with yourself, you got to admit to yourself how lucky you are. Why in the world would anybody marry you? You know, that's, I've come to that realization. And so I was excited. And i got to tell you something. This is the honest truth. After 50 years of being married, she still excites me. I still tingle when I give her a hug. I still enjoy seeing her and being with her. And you know, my friends, we, we, we've been 2,000 years into this church thing, and I still think we should be excited about who we are. That every time we go to church, we're turned on, looking up, feeling good. Because you see, we have a sacred responsibility. Now, sacred means about the same as holy. And in this case, it means that we were created by God. We are the called out people that belong to Jesus. We are special. We are different than any other group. We're not a club that comes together by our own choice week by week to see other people and to, to make friends. And I hope that we do make friends. And I hope that we do have good fellowship as we come together. But that is not the reason we exist. We exist with a, with a sacred beginning. It begins in the decision of God. It begins with the call of Jesus. We're as called out people. And if that doesn't make you excited, maybe your excitement machine is broken. What, I, what, what the Paul is saying is, that every time we come together, that we are in His presence. He is looking over our shoulder, as the message says. That every time we come together, Jesus is actually here. Isn't that great? Isn't that exciting? Show me something besides the stare. We have a, a specialness about us because of our holy beginning. And here we are knowing that one day he will appear. 
our Lord Jesus will come back. And when he comes back, he will judge the living and the dead. So in other words, if you're alive, he will judge you then. If you're dead, you will resurrect and be judged. For those who don't have Jesus, they'll be judged according to their sin. For, for those of us who are believers, we'll be judged according to how we have taken our second responsibility and followed it and done what God asked us to do. Now, as I describe the responsibility, I, I, it reminds me of, of a story. This woman stole a can of peaches, and she was being tried in court for shoplifting. I don't know where this was, but it wasn't California or New York. <laughs> ah, never mind. <laughs> and the judge said, um, how many peaches were in that can? And she said, well, uh, six. And, she, and he said, well, I think it would be just to sentence you to six days in jail. And the husband stood up and said, Your Honor, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> now, uh, I'm not sure what that, that joke really has to do with uh, what I'm saying, except for this. Our responsibility is not a can of peaches, it's a can of peas. In other words, it's big. There's a lot of things that God calls us to do. He, Paul describes it here, this way, that, that, that I'm going to give you a charge. I'm going to give you the responsibility. And that word charge, we don't use it very often. I wish that the NIV, as much as I love it, would translate a different way. I think I'm going to try to help you understand it you with know, a little bit of a paraphrase. What Paul is saying here is I urgently, from the bottom of my heart, ask you to do something, Timothy. And what you should do, and there's five commands here. What you should do is these five things. The first of the five commands is the most important one and the key one, and the other four describe it. Preach the word. Timothy, what, I, what you should do, now, what, now let me just, 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 just explain something a little bit further. Timothy has lost his excitement about church. He's a pastor. He's lost his tingle about being part of God's people. And Paul says all through this letter, it's a letter of encouragement. Timothy, get it back. Get back your excitement. Fan into a flame those embers. Timothy, what you should be doing is your sacred responsibility. You preach the word. You take the gospel in all of its beauty and all of its power. And, and Sunday by Sunday, you hold it up. Day by day, you live it and you preach it. Now, I, I want you to, to understand that he's not just talking to Timothy in this whole thing. He's also talking to you. You love the Word of God. You have a high view of it. And preaching is not just something that's done on a platform by a, a guy standing behind a pulpit. Preaching is what you do every day of your life, everywhere you are. You're holding up God's Word. There was a street preacher in New York City named Charles King. He's pretty famous back when he was alive. He would go to Times Square, and he would start his sermon by putting a hat on the ground. And then he would run around the, the, the square and go, It's alive! He sounded kind of like Dr. Frankenstein. It's alive! And people would start gathering in the crowd. And then he'd walk over to his hat, and he'd pick it up, and it was the Bible. And then he would hold up the Bible and he began to preach to the crowd something that he believed, that he was proclaiming, was alive. Just as alive now as it was in the day that it was inspired and revealed and written. We had this great privilege of every day holding up the living word of God. With our lips we speak it. With our lives we live it. It's an exciting thing to be part of God's people and a servant out of God's church because we have in our hands the living word of God. Now, in the other four commands, Paul expresses how to preach that word. And, and I'm just going to touch on each one because of the time we have in, together. He says, um, preach the word. Be prepared in season. Be prepared. Because... Sometimes the faith is in season and sometimes it's out of season. Sometimes in human history, the, the gospel's been very popular and sometimes it's not very popular. 
and you be ready for this. I want you to understand that just because you're a believer doesn't mean people are going to respect you. And just because you're part of a church doesn't mean people are going to come with you to your church. Because right now, the gospel is not as popular as it once was. So be prepared. Correct. Help people understand the right kind of life and use the word of God to bring it back, bring them back into line with what God's word says. Rebuke. Talk about sin and help people come to believe in Jesus and repent and encourage. It's not just to hit people over the head with, but to make them feel good about God and Jesus and to come into faith and belief. The great Charles Stanley was asked one time why he didn't talk more about God's judgment in his sermons. And he said that, well, you know, there's a place for that. But he said, most people come to church and they feel kind of broken and beaten, and I want to make it worse for them. I want them to come and hear how God loves them and accepts them and how they can be saved and how their lives changed. He did it with encouragement. Now, Paul was on to describe the mindset we should have as we preach the word. He says, do it with patience and do it with endurance. So that people won't just hear what you say and believe right away, so you patiently say it over and over and over again. And you keep on working to grow his church even when the gospel's out of season. Now, I told you a while ago, 50 years is coming up. Are you excited about this? Yeah, thank you very much. 18,250 days. Not that anybody's counting. And, and let, me, let, let me tell you how you, you're married for 50 years, day by day by day, 18,250 of them. And so all during that time, you're building your life together. That's how marriage works. You're building your life together. And, and this is what Paul is, is, is telling Timothy, a man who is burning out, a man who has lost his excitement. And maybe you've lost your excitement. Do you understand what our job is? Our job is to preach the word. Use it to correct people gently. Use it to talk about sin. Use it to bring people inside of the kingdom that they can be saved. Do it with encouragement. Because people need to be lifted up and made to feel good about who God is and who Jesus is. And do it day by day by day by day for years. And that's how our church is built. Now Paul says, he's very honest, honest about this, that it's not going to be easy. Our work of preaching the word is not going to be easy. Our work of building the church day by day is not going to be easy. Paul says, listen, the, the, the reason it won't be easy is that, that as time goes on, people who are believers, or maybe not, are, are not going to want to hear the truth. It is normal for people to lose their way and to wander off, even believers. I was talking to a fellow outside a while ago, one of our security guys, and, and you know if you're put in the middle of a desert and you start to walk, that you'll always walk in a real big circle. And do you know why? One of your legs is longer than the other. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and you know, this guy thinks he's getting out of the desert. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to escape this. And he ends up back where he started because of this, this tendency we have to lose our way and, and, and not to know where to go. And Paul says, listen, the time is coming where people won't want to hear the truth. And, and they'll gather to themselves uh, teachers who will say what they want them to hear, that you're great people, that you're wonderful, that God wants you to be wealthy and happy, and, and, and never hear really what the gospel says. Now, in chapter 3, first part of chapter 3, I didn't preach from it because it's so dense and so thick that it really is better for teaching and preaching. But Paul says that in the latter days, people will have itching ears and gather to themselves teachers who will scratch that itch. Now, unfortunately, I understand why 
we have understood that as being about the end of all of time, and this will happen right before Jesus returns, but that's not what Paul says. He says in the last days. The last days, this is what scholars believe, the last days began when Jesus went into heaven and continue until the day he appears when he returns. Timothy was in the last days. We're in the last days. Are you getting this? And because we're in the last days, when Paul talks about a, a time coming when people will listen to myths, made up stories, have, their, have itching ears wanting to hear things that make them happy, what they want to hear, not the real story of the gospel, but what they want that makes them feel good, that time is now. The church has always had a tendency to drift from the truth. You know, for a thousand years, the church of God thought that we had to earn our own salvation through our own actions, what we did. It was good Christ died on the cross, but that wasn't enough. We had to earn our, own mer- earn our salvation by our own merit. That's not true. It's by grace you say through faith. And so I just want an example of how the church strays away from truth. In these days, the myth, are you ready to be shocked? Are you going to hold on to your, your chair? In these days, the myth, the story that the church of God is following in almost every major denomination, even inside of Southern Baptist life, is the myth of social justice that the reason Jesus came was to take down the oppressors, to help the oppressed, and to change the political systems of man. That's why he came. Now, I want you to understand that that the Bible talks about justice, and justice is a good thing. It's the right thing. Make sure that everybody is treated fairly, and no one is judged by the color of their skin or their background or anything about them other than they are a person that God loves. But social justice is nowhere to be found in Scripture. It's not mentioned a single time. The concept is not mentioned a single time. It comes out of communism and Marxism. And because of that, what we're hearing being preached by churches and taught by pastors is a political message and not a gospel message. And if you want to know why, The church of God in America has declined so rapidly. Yes, even we Baptists have lost 3 3 million members in the last 15 years. It's because we've stopped preaching the gospel and we're talking about some kind of myth that comes from somewhere else. Now, I was watching this football game last Sunday night. It's the only one I've watched all year. You may have heard about it. The Super Bowl, have you heard about this? You may have watched it too, I don't know. But anyway... um, I was so glad when the, when the gun went off at the end of the game, that meant that a real sport's going to get anybody to start. <laughs> Baseball. As I was watching the, the uh, game, I saw this commercial. Jesus, he gets us. Now, I've seen a number of these commercials, and I, you know, I thought most of them were pretty good. And, and I don't like doing this. I don't like doing this. I really don't. The people behind the commercials, I've looked into them. They're they're good people, and and I I don't want to be critical of them. I know many believers thought that the commercial was was, uh, good. They enjoyed it. And if if you're someone like that, I'm not criticizing you. I'm not telling you you have to agree with me. Are you listening? I'm not telling you you have to agree with me. I just want you to consider my thoughts, okay? And, And what really gets me is that that commercial happened in the same week that I'm speaking from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I can't, I can't avoid it. I can't do it. Because that was a commercial presenting the gospel in a social justice way. And so what, what you have is, is a, a bunch of people who are oppressors washing the feet of people who are oppressed. And then Jesus, he gets us. Now, the story about washing the disciples' feet in John's gospel, Jesus is washing not our feet, but his disciples' feet. 
And the reason he's doing that is to teach them a lesson. It's an acted out parable. You wash each other's feet. So the idea is that I'm caring for you. And now you care for the other people inside of God's church. That's part of the acted out parable. And then he offers to Peter the washing. And he says, I'm washing your feet. Peter said, don't wash my feet. Well, you know, unless I wash your feet, you can have no part of me. And what he means by that is, unless I die on the cross for your sins and cleanse you by my blood, you can't be part of the kingdom of God. And so the, the idea of washing feet is all about not just us our caring for each other, but also that Jesus died on the cross for us to cleanse us from all of our sin with his blood, and that's acted out. So washing people's feet is not a sign of caring and acceptance. Washing people's feet is a sign of the gospel. Jesus dying, you're repenting, and then being accepted because you repent. To say that Jesus accepts us is only a partial truth. A partial truth. He accepts us and then asks us to repent of our sin. And then he will change us. You know what? Uh, Jesus, uh, there's a great story here that, from Scripture that uh, is, a, is about this. Jesus is walking along the road. And he's calling people to himself. And he sees a man at a tax collector's booth named Levi, who is probably Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And he says to Levi, he says, Come, follow me. Now, tax collectors were sinners, pretty bad sinners. And Levi got right up, left his life, and followed Jesus. Do you see this? Jesus said, I, I accept you, I want you, but you come and follow me. And Levi followed him and lived a different kind of life. And then that night, Levi throws a, a party at his house for all of his tax-collecting friends and all of his prostitute friends. And Jesus goes. And he talks to the, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And we don't know what he said. But I can tell you, I'm pretty sure what he didn't say. None of the leaders accept you, but you're all right in my book. Are you, are you getting this? How shocked are you right now? Are you all right? I think we need to bring in some paramedics. <laughs> so he didn't say, hey, you're all right in my book. Instead, he said, God loves you. I've come to die for you. You believe you'll be forgiven. And I'll give you a new life. And then the Gospels say that a large number of tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners followed Jesus. Do you know why they followed him? Because he saved them. And he gave them a new life. He changed them. That's really what the Gospel is. I want you to be aware of something. Half a truth is no truth at all. So the job is not going to be easy because we lose our way. We wander from the truth. And we stop reaching people because we no longer hold up the living Word of God. Now, with that all being said, be optimistic. Believe in the power of the gospel. Believe in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to save people. Let me read again what he says, but you keep your head in all situations. In other words, don't give up when things don't go right and no one's listening. Don't quit. Endure whatever hardship you have to endure, Timothy, but keep on doing the work of an evangelist. Keep on spreading the word. Do all the things God has asked you to do in your ministry. You do them because God will give you the victory. Be optimistic. I was uh, watching this show, Undercover Boss, a few years ago. And this week the show was about waste management, that company waste management. And the CEO pretended to be a trainee in various jobs. He got fired several times. Okay? But, but one of the guys training him for one of the jobs was a man responsible for servicing the porta potties. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this story. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, anyway, the, the, the guy was optimistic. He was happy. And he said to, to the CEO, he said, listen, when you go to a porta potty and you open the door, you never know what you're going to find. But this is war. And the, later on, he was promoted, and his new job was to go to different parts of the company and talk about optimism. 
that no matter how hard the job is, that that's why you're there to fight the war and you're going to be able to win the victory. And sometimes, you know, I get down. I'm like Timothy, you know, uh, doing the work of uh, pastoring and teaching and preaching. This sermon for me is like laying an ostrich egg. It's not very much fun. I'm not enjoying this a great deal. But you do it because that's your job. And you do it because it's what God wants you to do, and you just you endure it. And I remind myself of this story all the time. Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is like a, a mustard seed, the smallest of all the garden seeds. And it's planted in the ground, and out of that seed grows a great plant that's as big as a tree. And then Jesus says, all the birds of the air come and make their nest in a mustard plant. Now that is a parable, but it takes on some aspects of what we call an allegory. An allegory is a, is a, is a message that's deeper than the story. Those, those birds of the air coming and, and making their, their nest in the, in, the, in the mustard plant are the kingdoms of the world becoming part of the church. And what Jesus is teaching in this parable is that the kingdom of God, no matter what happens, will grow and grow and grow until it conquers the world. And I believe that. Do you believe that? And if you believe this, it will make you incredibly optimistic that as we live our life day by day by day, preaching the word and correcting and rebuking and doing the work of an evangelist and all the things that is part of our charge, our sacred responsibility, that God will bless what we do with victory. Timothy, get your head off your chest. Don't be down. Listen, my friends, don't be down. The church of God will win the victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're coming now looking at your word. And we are challenged by it. That you have for us a second responsibility. So we're a holy people designed for a purpose. You lifted us out of the world and gave us a task. And our job is to preach the word, the living word of God. And to believe as we preach it that just preaching it is enough. Just holding it up is powerful. That Jesus, the most attractive man who ever lived, will draw all men to himself. And right now, Father, I'm praying that you will draw people to yourself. Right now, my friend, you may be thinking about believing in Jesus. And if you're thinking about believing in Jesus, I pray that you'll pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. Will you come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer with me, you're now part of God's family. Let me know about your decision whether here at West Portsmouth, take the, ch the card out of the chair, take the uh, form off the worship program, talk to our online counselor. They're waiting for you. Let us know about your decision. We'll share with you more about how to grow in your faith as a believer. Heavenly Father, we pray that we'll be excited about your church and optimistic about its future. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, or follow us on social media so you don't miss any future content from DC Church.